Okay, we're gonna get started here. Um, we're in the home stretch, to use a great baseball analogy. We started off this morning with that great story about home plate. Um, okay, well, you made it. We're in the last hour, congratulations. Um, give yourselves a round of applause, then everyone will come in and think they're missing something. <laughs> it's like when you're laughing and you, people are laughing and you miss the joke. Um, Okay, so um, a couple things I wanted to mention. One thing, actually, someone from Refed just highlighted for me that I think is always good to mention. Refed is hiring, so please check the website. They have a number of positions. Um, I was told to highlight it for this group, so you already have like a foot in the door. Um, so please know that, tell your friends. Um, to close out, before we do our official close out, we're gonna do a panel on collaboration, which is certainly one of my favorite topics. Um, as we all know, this work is incredibly complex, and it not only requires innovation and collaboration, but sometimes unusual collaborations and creative, out-of-the-box thinking to create those relationships. So I'm excited to introduce Emily Ma. Oh my God, sorry, Emily. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Emily Ma. Who, oh, okay, we're good. She is the head of special projects in sustainability in workplace at Google. She's also a Refed board member, so she's very well versed in, in Refed and all things that you all are doing. Um, so please welcome to stage Emily and her panel. All right, everybody. We've got quite the gang coming up in the right order, right? Awesome, good, okay, so. Emily, here's your clicker. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, as everybody comes up, it's quite the slate. We even have a non-human panelist for the first time in refed history, perhaps in any conference history. It's gonna be an exciting, exciting hour together as we bring it to a close. But we're gonna start with a quick activity. So, uh, because Refed is incredibly, incredibly amazing when it comes to content, it's even more amazing with its relationships. I'm gonna take a look at all of your relationships that you've built. So, stand up if you've met someone from a different state. Okay, keep staying, okay, and if the questions apply to you, keep staying standing. Stand up if you've met somebody from a different country. Okay, all right. Uh, stand up if you've spoken to somebody from a different sector. Somebody who is not, if you're nonprofit, you're looking for somebody who's not in nonprofit. If you're, you know, working for a for-profit, you're speaking to somebody who's not in for-profit. Okay, good, good. Okay, final one. Stand, stay standing if you have been speaking with someone who your boss would consider a competitor. <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. Oh, okay, ooh, there are brave ones out there, very brave ones who are speaking privately, starting a revolution. Okay, so this is what this last session is about. It's about a bunch of us rule breakers in the past five, 10 years who have chosen to maybe draw outside the lines a little bit, maybe color outside the lines a little bit because we see the potential to collaborate across countries, across sectors, between competitors. So I am so thrilled to introduce an incredible panel of individuals who will each share their story and conversation. And then we'll finish with a few learnings for all of you who are wherever you are in your journey. So from left to right, I guess my left to my right, your right to your left, uh, we have Sane Struzneider from the Wageningen University from the Netherlands in conversation with Stephen Lapage from Australia, uh, talking about their collaboration north-south, 15,000 kilometers apart, country to country. Then we have Ben Collier of the Farmland Project and Becky Garrison from the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, I got that right, that was hard, uh, who will talk about collaborating between governments and nonprofits to move, I kid you not, like 40 million pounds of apples. We will then move downstream and have our very own Jackie Suggett from ReFed, who is the reason why we're all here, right? Yeah, yeah, give her a huge round of applause. Jackie is really the reason. Uh, and Natasha, 
TOEFL from Sprouts. The two of them worked together to get the Pacific Coast Food Waste Collaborative going together some five, six years ago. And now it's grown up and having huge impact nationally. So we're going to hear about how retailers are working with retailers across competition lines to do great things. And then we're going to finish off with a conversation with um, Harry Tannenbaum from Mill and uh, Mr. Pasta La Vista, who is, as you can see, our first non-human panelist, about the role of data in making changes in consumer behavior in homes. So with a huge round of applause, please welcome all of our speakers for this final panel. OK. So we're going to kick off uh, with North-South. This is kind of a unique collaboration here. So Stephen and Sane, you met quite some time ago. And I wanted to start off with your work, Stephen. You are the head of a CRC, which I learned stands for a Cooperative Research Center. Could you tell us a little bit about food waste in Australia and what a CRC is and like, what took you to the Netherlands on a very long plane flight? Sure, thanks, Emily. Um, uh, we, so the Cooperative Research Centre program started just over 30 years ago in Australia, and it's all about industry-based science. So Australia's very good at producing science, we're very poor at commercialising science, and that's why the CRC program was set up. So we're quite unique in that way, in that uh, as a food waste or organisation, we started off in private industry R&D, um, looking for solutions to food waste, and we've used that as a foundation from which to build out now with voluntary agreements and sector action plans. and shortly a behaviour change campaign as well. Amazing. So um, you have a board member from the Netherlands. How did yeah. that come about? So I was putting together this CRC proposal, which was $130 million at the time. It's a, quite a significant investment in food waste. Mm -hmm. And that was back in, uh, started in 2015. And I met uh, Twan Timmermans, uh, who Sunny uh, works with uh, in the Netherlands. and. Uh, uh, Tuan, uh, as well as being completely huge, which, <laughs> which is a Dutch thing, of course, but uh, uh, he, uh, when I met him, uh, it was an OECD event and then a G20 event, and I just thought, you, you are so knowledgeable <laughs> about food loss and waste, we need you on our board from the start. And, you know, why it was never easy having a uh, director from the Netherlands on an Australian board and all the meetings that we have, uh, it, it's worked out incredibly well and it was a huge boost to our bid um, because they knew we weren't going to try and reinvent the wheel in Australia. We had the best expertise internationally on our board from day one. Amazing. So, Sane, let's come over to the Netherlands. You, as a country, were way ahead of the game. You knew that food waste was important, I think, before the rest of us had any idea what it was. So. What was it about the Netherlands that gave it such a head start? Well, uh, I think it's, it's good to know that uh, although we are very small as a country, we are very big in food. Uh, so we are the world's second largest exporter of Aji food in the world, just oh after the US in terms oh of revenue. So we're big. Uh, and we're also big in research on food and agri uh, uh, from Wageningen. Uh, so we, early on in the game, recognized the, the massive challenge that food loss and waste uh, uh, was and, and started working on how we could quantify that, work on methodologies to measurement. Um, and in that sense, uh, we started that journey early. Uh, but to be honest, um, we have been pushing that in the early days from from research and from policy, and, and um, uh, we had a lot of momentum, and a lot of initiatives, but they were all small and beautiful, and we didn't see any decline. Oh, man. Yeah. Why? Why? You, you have all these policies in place, you have all these incentives in place. What was missing? Well, for us, what was really missing was those who put food on a plate or on a shelf. Mm. So in the beginning, we were in focus on the private sector, uh, and that really was our game changer. Um, so we started with literally 25 people, a lot of CEOs, front runners in the game, in a room, and we developed a national strategy, and that was the big game changer. Mm -hmm. And that has evolved now to a full-blown ecosystem with over 100 stakeholders from the full food supply chain, really accelerating uh, and collaborating towards delivering impact on food loss and waste reduction. And we've seen some really great examples, especially in the retail, for example. We've been benchmarking for a few years now, 
uh, with retailers. They all know where their hotspots are. That really activated the full sector and we've delivered a 17% wow. uh, reduction at retail level and we cover more than 80% of our market. Wow. Uh, and they also buy into our consumer food waste uh, free week. Mm. Um, and through their channels, both in store and marketing, we are able to reach uh, 7 million uh, Dutch inhabitants uh, and 35% uh, of every Dutch person actually uh, did something extra to reduce food waste Whoa. during that week. So that's massive impact. Wow, amazing. Okay, so uh, we're going to go back to the Australia now. We can teleport here on stage because we have technology. Uh, tell me, Stephen, tell me a little bit more about what you adapted from your learnings from Twane and from the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I think the reason Tuan was interested in joining our board is we were taking that industry approach from day yeah. one, and he said that is different, and yeah. it's, you know, the, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this in this room, but, you know, in Australia we often say that Europe regulates, America innovates, and we're trying to find our middle ground <laughs> in between. Um, and, you know, I think uh, having industry on board from the very start, the way CRCs work is that industry puts up half the money and then the federal government matches it mm. dollar for dollar mm. and then we use that for grants or to work with them uh, individual companies to solve their food waste solutions so we wanted to follow the Dutch model but we want to make sure that industry was on from day one and then we'd build out from that and we continue to build um, normally at this point of time in a CRC we're six years into ten mm. you would be losing industry participants and we're gaining all the time you know 15, 20 new industry partners every year. Uh, and that's a great sign after six years. Well, um, given that uh, you are both in growth mode and changing, what are words of advice you would leave our audience or a call to action for our audience that you would want to see? Um, what I would love to share with you is that you have to be consistent in your messaging. So keep telling the same very true story about delivering impact for people, planet, and profit. And, and go everywhere, but don't echo the room. Mm. So this is lovely for us to meet mm. here, but we all agree on that this is important. So go and meet people that you do actually not agree with, and then really have that discussion. Listen, learn, engage. Uh, this is my, uh, last year was my first time at Refed actually, and even though that we are front runners and doing pretty well on this topic, I learned so much and mm. I really had take away home messages, a big shout out to, to Ben and also Vanessa, for example, for last year, really opening my eyes as to that we have to put our next generation much more at our strategy level involved and also looking at a more social inclusiveness agenda. That, was, that were take away home messages for me that were very valuable. Yeah. One of my favorite learnings from Sane when we first spoke was that she went from like third grade classrooms to discos. I don't know what kind of story you tell at a disco about food waste, but apparently she figured out how to do it. So tailor the message to your audience, yeah, right? Yeah, you do that in a silent disco mode because otherwise nobody can hear you. <laughs> can you do an interpretive dance that explains what food waste is? Somebody in this room is probably able to do that. It's not me. <laughs> well, Stephen, how about you? Uh, for me, it's really about the need to create the burning platform. Mm -hmm. um, we're preaching to the converted here. Uh, when we talk to our ministers in Australia, it's about plastics. It's about carbon um, and greenhouse gas emissions. It's not about food waste. Mm -hmm. And we're yet to create that burning platform in the Australian government, even though you know, they've been a great supporter of ours, um, to really take it to the 2030 target. Um, at the moment, we're probably about 50% short in funding. Um, and uh, so that's what we need to, to find, and the only way we can find that is through really driving home the critical role that food waste plays in a larger food ecosystem, mm. um, because otherwise it'll play second fiddle to other environmental causes. You're right, and uh, for those of you out there who work for multinational organizations, if you do have a branch in Australia, I think Stephen and his colleague Sam out there, if you could raise your hand, would love to speak to you. No? Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to move back to the United States now and talk about from farms to food banks. You ready? Everybody ready? Okay. Okay, Ben and Becky. Okay, let's, let's start with 
Apples, oh my God, so many freaking apples. I'm gonna read out a quote that I found very interesting here. Okay, so okay. since we are near West Virginia, uh, I'm gonna quote Senator uh, Manchin, who said, uh, this recovery of apples is remarkable in its efficiency and effectiveness. It's a force multiplier that enables USDA to optimize its funding to ensure that the maximum amount of salvageable food reaches the largest number of people possible. I don't even know what he's talking about. What he's talking about? Thank you. Uh, before we start, thank you, Refed. Uh, Refed was FarmLink's first grant maker, will always be. And uh, also Emily. Emily is a professor at Stanford. She, ben, she, she absolutely controls Google to bend over backwards for <laughs> everyone in this room. And she's a mentor to so many of us, so thank you, Emily. Um, he went off script. Who here has had an apple? Yeah. Same. Um, last year, we got to present a film that we made, that we actually got to screen before that uh, at, at Refed. And we just applied through this website to screen our film at uh, the Capitol <laughs> in DC. And so Emily and I got to speak up there. Uh, there was this amazing moment where Oh, there's that picture. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. me and Emily next to some pr pretty cool people. Um, <laughs> and after that, we got introduced to the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, who heard our story and said, we're going to connect you with some folks. And before long, we were speaking with the West, Vir West Virginia Department of Agriculture, who said, FarmLink, we have 11 apple growers that have worked all season to grow 40 million beautiful, nutritious apples, and they lost their contracts a month before, two months before harvest. And this is a situation that happens all too often. The Department of Agriculture had the funding to pay these farmers to harvest the apples, and they said, we don't have the infrastructure to distribute that to enough communities around the country. And we said, this is our opportunity. Three years in the making, we went $700,000 over budget for the year to prove this was possible. And over the next six weeks, we delivered 350 truckloads of apples to 120 amazing food banks that we partnered with in 20 different states. And it was one yeah. of the most collaborative, yeah. thank you. It was one of the most collaborative produce recovery efforts in the history of food banks. So crazy. So Becky, you were sitting in that room, right? I didn't even know you at that point. Well, this actually happened before I was even in my job. Oh. So my colleagues were like, who is that? We need to introduce you. Whoa. And so I came on board last September and got to meet everybody in person last September. So. so I have not heard of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. I practiced that 10 times now so I can say it well. <laughs> I'm impressed. Uh, tell us more about what it is and what it does and why this is important. Sure, sure. So we can call it NASDA for short, um, but the National Association for State Departments of Ag, we are a bipartisan organization and our members are the directors, secretaries, and commissioners that run the State Departments of Ag across the U.S. and for four territories. And they really sit at this nexus of growing food and also feeding people. So advocating and implementing those programs, those grants, all the way down through the chain, which they really get to sit in that middle where Secretary Vilsack called it out yesterday, that economic side of the coin as well as the nutrition security part. So there was great excitement to see what happened last fall. Um, and really, I think, you know, in this space, we tend to separate those a little too often, whether it's through, you know, private market development, in policy, in society, based on what we know, we separate those two things. And so we really advocate for putting those back together and talking about how we serve local and regional food systems and how we look to sustain them and also feed people at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Huge applause, huge applause. Um, ben, so the two of you have been working together. You have this incredible proof point now. Like, what are you, the two of you up to next? What's going on? What's going on next? Do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, you know, I will just talk a little bit more about, I think, just what was so unique about how FarmLink stepped into this apple rescue last fall. Um, essentially, you know, when you have a loss on a farm, it's not just a loss on that farm itself, but it's the entire community who has hands on that farm, who's paid by that farm. And so it can completely wreak havoc when you don't actually get any of 
any of that money back. All of your inputs are already exhausted. You, are, you don't have additional folks or bodies or wages to look for a home for this food, to pick up this food, to load it, to transport it. Think of just the amount of gas and drivers to drive 350 semi-trucks to 100 different agencies that were accepting it. And so that's not even a resource that it's available because at that point in time, those farms are actually dealing with not going under. And so there are some great mechanisms in place that help do that. But what was really amazing is that that wasn't an option at that moment. And FarmLink, with connecting with the commissioner in, in West Virginia, and then also working with Senator Manchin in West Virginia, were able to look at, at the funding that exists currently and look for an innovative way to apply it, to use it, and stop that chain reaction. And so that ripple effect, which actually goes both ways, from the hunger side where it's just waste, and then we also have greenhouse gas emission issues with it, and it's not feeding anybody, is also going backwards up the chain. And so that's where they came in, they have met that need, they were incredibly flexible and innovative to do it, and it is just such a wonderful example, and so we wanna advocate for more opportunities like that. Um, and I'll pause there, I get excited. So 10 <laughs> minutes is a short <laughs> amount of time for me. <laughs> Ben? Yeah, I'll add a little bit more. Um, in 2020, the USDA purchased $6 billion worth of protein and dairy and produce during this emergency farm, Farmers to Families food box program. And we were three months old at FarmLink. Uh, we were all still in college, and we really didn't know what we were doing. And we got connected with a dairy company that had sold 700 million servings of dairy to the USDA and was expected to equitably distribute that dairy to communities around the country, which is obviously a, an impossible task. And we, it, it almost felt crazy that we were in this position, but we became one of their main outlets for helping them connect with hundreds of communities that otherwise wouldn't have had access to that dairy. And that's, that's so fucking crazy. But we, <laughs> <laughs> but we really spent the last four years trying to solve for that. And where we are now is, looking at these pockets of surplus that have historically gone to waste, like those apples last year, there's gonna be so much more than that this year in states throughout the Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest, the Northwest. And we view FarmLink as a pathway, a logistics and a collaboration hub to get that food to as many communities as possible that have histor historically not had access to these billions of servings of fresh produce. And so that's what we're really working towards and it's gonna take partnership with as many hunger fighting organizations as possible with national and state level policy groups and of course the farmers themselves. I wanna reflect something that was really important in our conversations for this uh, panel. Uh, Becky, you talked about how uh, solutions need to be localized and layer and there are many solutions, right? So they all work together and it's not one solution, it's many and for those of you out there, we represent the many solutions, and that's what our communities need, our farming communities need, in order to really, really not have, as Secretary Strickland said this morning, an entire tractor trailer full of food go to waste. We need to be able to respond quickly, and whoever is there needs to be given the ability to do so, right? Yeah, absolutely. So at NASDA, I get to work on policy in that space. Um, we need the systems that exist already from the federal level, from the state level, and we also need more. And so that's what we advocate for regularly, and we look for it in a bipartisan space. So a way that we can work on saving producers, keeping farms farmers farming and keep them on their land, growing food that we need and nutritious food, and while simultaneously stopping food waste. There was just a statistic I saw last week that came out from a from an ag trade report that we are, in 2024, we expect um, imports into the US of food to go up by $1.5 billion this year, and it's mostly fresh fruits and vegetables that are coming in. Meanwhile, we all know that there's 38% going to waste, and so we can't, we can't just go and correct that, but what we can do is look at programs and policies that actually put our local food systems back at the center, put connecting those. Um, I'm so pleased that we had a strategy come out this week. There's some great programs targeting this. And then two, I'm, I'm probably too optimistic to be in policy, but uh, you know, the past few years we've seen <laughs> programs like the local food purchase assistance agreements. We've also seen, um, you know, we've got our regional food business centers standing up from USDA across the US. And I think these are great tools in place. It's gonna take a minute, but we need all cylinders firing so we have that flexibility so we can cover logistics and transportation. And I certainly hope that 
I'm taking too much time, but I certainly hope that we um, also will see a farm bill that comes out in the yes. future that looks at solutions like this, that checks multiple boxes at the same time and stops separating how we feed people with how we also keep farms farming. Yes. So. yes. We're rule breakers. So, Ben, I want you to finish with your comment about shared values because that's something that Jesse brought up yesterday. So tell me about shared values. Yeah, and Sprouts is my favorite farmer's market and grocery <laughs> store, uh, so we might go a minute over, but I do shop there every day, um, or every week. Um, okay. Uh, Early on in FarmLink, it felt easy to quickly understand some of the shortcomings in the hunger fighting and food banking space. And I think a lot of you have experienced those all too well. And we could talk about territorialism and uh, a lack of focus on collaborative values. But I think it's a lot harder to articulate, if given the space, what we would do differently. And we've had hundreds of conversations with community partners over the past few years. And a lot of those end up talking about values and principles. And we wrote something called the Shared Plate Pledge with them. It is not uh, much of a set of commitments. It is more centering around values of innovation, pushing to uplift innovation that uh, helps make efficient and effective solutions for our growers, for our food recipients, and for our climate. It focuses on democratization of information and lessons learned so as many people as possible can be a part of implementing those solutions. And it focuses on collaboration, where if you have more of a resource than you need, it is a part of your mission to get it to other partners who could make the most of that resource. Yeah. And so this pledge doesn't call for much. It's mostly for those who sign an invitation to be held accountable to these principles and values. And often what I find is in the moments of greatest tension, it's these values that seem so obvious that are the values that are abandoned. And so it's www.sharedplatepledge.org. If you're willing to go on and it feels like it resembles what you stand for, please sign. It's, I think, going to make a huge difference from a storytelling and an advocacy standpoint. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. OK. We're going to move downstream now, since we have covered uh, farms. We're going to go to fierce retail competitors. Dum, dum, dum. I am so excited about this because I remember when the Pacific Coast Food Waste Collaborative was just a baby, right? And when you ask a bunch of for-profit organizations who are, you know, very low single-digit margins to share information and data, I was like, oh, this is going to be hard. But there were six cities across the West Coast, so Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, Oakland, San Francisco, and I am missing one, Los Angeles, uh, got together and said, we're going to try and do this. And a number of you in the room decided that you would participate. Jackie at the helm, like, I was like, oh, OK. So what happened, Jackie? What was this all about? Dun, dun, dun. No, that was a great setup. So yeah, in the, the states along the Pacific Coast participated this in well as well. And many of them are here. At least they were here. If they're still here, they've made the trek out to share this story. So thank you for coming. Um, but yeah, they basically said, hey, there's this thing called food waste. We want to be leaders on the West Coast in addressing food waste in, in the region. And to do that, we want to partner with food businesses. So they brought in Refed, they brought in our partners at WWF and RAP, and basically said, help us to create this public-private partnership, a voluntary agreement to address food waste ambitiously on the West Coast. And so that happened, and it, it started slow. Natasha was actually one of the first. I'll let her speak about her experience here in a minute. But we brought them together, really aligned with the global framework that we see with voluntary agreements, including in Australia, um, around Target Measure Act. So these were companies that were committed to reducing food waste. Uh, they were committed to measuring and reporting, and we'll talk more about data in a minute, so I won't go in too deep now, but then also to go beyond data to action, and that's the pre-competitive collaboration in topic and sector-based working groups, and then really focusing on not only piloting, but scaling solutions. And to Ben's point, sharing what works, right, openly, and, and being willing to share what didn't work, perhaps, as well, to um, accelerate the learning that came out of that. So, Natasha. You work for Sprouts, Sprouts Farmers Markets, which I didn't know was the full name, by the way. There are 400 of them across the country now, which is amazing. And your company was willing to be one of the first names on that list. So how did you make that happen? That's always hard being one of the first to go. Well, um, you know, first and foremost, before I 
dive into that question. Ben, I'm also a fan of FarmLink and the work that you're doing, so mutual love yeah. there. <laughs> also, it's my first time at ReFed. I just want to give a shout out to the ReFed team. This has been yes. one of the most profound yes. experiences for yes. me. Yes. Not only do I get to sit on this stage with this group of bad asses, um, but also all of you are incredible, and I'm so honored to share space with you and learn from you and be re-inspired and reinvigorated in the work that I'm doing. Um, on the corporate side of things here because of these last few days. Um, but yeah, it really goes back to our company's core values. We care, we own it, and we love being different. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're a tiny but mighty team on a very large mission to achieve zero waste by 2030. So we kind of jumped at the chance to get any help we can um, from our peers in this you know, pre-competitive collaborative nature. Um, in addition to that, it gave us incredible data insights that we didn't have access to, you know, acquiring and understanding and interpreting and collecting and analyzing all this data is a challenge when you have 400 stores across the country. Um, and so we just really embraced the opportunity to try something that not everyone else maybe was willing to be the pioneer to kind of say, hey guys, this actually worked really well for us and has given us incredible insights, new projects and things that we can continue to work on together with ReFed and beyond. So I want to come back to you, Natasha. The way you engage with the Pacific Coast West Coast Collaborative, sorry, Pacific Coast Food Waste Collaborative. There's a lot of it's acronyms like in this space. Yeah. It's like, I got to practice. PCFWC. P yeah, I know, I know. It's like, you know, a tongue twister here. Um, you uh, basically share information through the Food Waste Calculator. What is that? So the food waste calculator is uh, an anom an anom anonymized, I, I can't say the word, you did but you know it. where you I'm it. getting at, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, data model that analyzes how much food is actually uh, being wasted um, through sales and inventory data along with weight information and average price per pound. I think I'm getting a little she, too she, detailed. She's doing my pitch for me. <laughs> this is great. No, you're... <laughs> And then ReFed does a fantastic job of uh, anonymizing this data and carrying it out to the masses, including participants um, in the PCFWC um, to help us get how good are we doing? How, are we filling the gap? Are we closing the gap? What do we need to be doing? Um, I don't think I can te technically explain it as well as I need to. I, I think you got it. I think Jackie really thought about this with her team, how to make it super easy to sign on. For those of you who have not signed on yet. So Jackie, tell us more about how you make it super easy to join. Super easy. Well, well let me go against that immediately say measuring is hard, right? And I think if our business partners in the room had a nickel for every time they heard just measure, like they could probably retire. Um, so measurement is hard, data is hard. Data is also valuable, by the way, like it takes time, right? It, it's a huge value to these businesses. Um, so we did want to make it as super easy as we could and possible. Um, and a lot of us on our team that we're working at the time, we, we come from industry. I come from retail, other partners in our team come from manufacturing and, and other retailers. So we understood where the starting point was and I think what those challenges were. So our goal was first to make it super simple and as much as we could, but the way we did that was Let's look at the data that is actually readily available. Mm -hmm. ReFed is built on the backbone of data and methodology, so we said we actually have some resources we could plug in to fill those gaps. So let's use the data that is available for these businesses. Let's use our methodology to layer on top of that to get to the data that we actually want and need. The second thing we wanted to do is streamline reporting. Shockingly, we are not the only ones asking you for data, are we? No. No. <laughs> right. And that not on food waste data either, right? There are many other people. So we wanted to streamline that reporting so if they did it once, they could be, apply that same data set across the various areas they're reporting. But perhaps most importantly is we wanted to provide the value back to these food businesses as well, right? So we, we are asking for a lot of work and a lot of value when we ask for data and we want to give that value back. So we do publicly report. Um, that's important for measuring progress and motivating the masses, but um, if, if you've heard me talk at all this summer yet, this is going to be repetitive for you, but public reporting doesn't reduce food waste, right? Okay. So how do we actually That's go right. further than that with the data and turn it into decision-ready data? So we, we funnel this data right back into our working groups to help identify the hot spots of where our signatories should be focusing basing, based on their data. And then we try to provide individual value back in the form of roadmaps for our signatories that provide analytics of their waste, provides benchmarking against their peers, and runs through refeds models to prioritize solutions in the ROI of those solutions within their business. 
amazing. So I want to highlight something for any of you who are considering joining the pact. Decision-ready data, right? So there's a reason why you're sharing the data. And the fact that the food waste calculator is fully in the signatory's control, so you're not sharing any financial data, right? Makes it a much easier sell into your leadership. But I'm gonna pass it back to the expert here. Natasha, you had to sell this to your leadership. Did you tell the same story to your CMO, your CFO, your chief legal officer, and all of the C's up there? Everybody gets a different story, guys. Mm. <laughs> know your audience in terms of whether it's you know selling the idea of joining, because the US Food Waste Pact is organized, right, official now. Um, and just knowing, you know, whether it's cost reduction or shrink uh, analysis and understanding which categories of food might be experiencing a higher rate of shrink, it really is dependent mm. on the audience that you're addressing to. Re I know an increasing amount of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day is related to regulatory compliance. So that's another benefit of having access to a partnership like this is pre-collaborative, you can hear what your peers are doing, you can understand what's working from a compliance perspective and what's not. I think it also really helps that your chief sustainability officer is your chief legal officer. That was kind of a great <laughs> insight there. It may, or it makes it a little bit more challenging oh, okay. to sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> because you've really got to go through to the point every possible thing you can think of when you're dealing with a yeah. chief legal officer, AKA an attorney. <laughs> Well, let's uh, give Jackie the last word here. So you have now expanded nationally. How do you folks in the room who are interested sign up? What is the U.S. Food Waste Pack? Close it out. Well, let me, let me go back to the first question, too. I, I want to acknowledge our partners at the PCFWC because they, they were first movers and took the risk in starting this regional program, right? Investing in it, helping design it, and incubate that, by the way, through COVID, which was a tough time to be doing anything collaboratively in business. Um, but we were starting to get demand you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, from businesses that operate outside of the Pacific Coast region, from local governments, from regional partnerships outside of the Pacific Coast region. And we had this proven model that, that was working. And so in December, we did launch the US Food Waste Pact. Um, can we actually get that slide back up on the screen? Because I just, this is a slide full of fir first movers and risk takers. So if, if you are associated with one of these logos, can we just stand up for a second? And yes. Huge round of applause. Stand up you're if you're doing. here representing you. those companies. Awesome. Yeah. And so I think we have this national program now that is helping to build upon the work that started on the West Coast. But I also want to acknowledge we're not the only ones playing in this space, right? Just at this summit on Tuesday, we had the, um, the USDA and EPA champions. We had Food Waste Reduction Alliance. RAP has hosted a meeting just today. There are a lot of people playing in this space. And I think our vision of the US Food Waste Pact, very similar to other national programs that have been present and presenting at the summit this week, is to help with the coordination and collaboration among all that work that's happening nationally. How can we fill the gaps? How can we bring the data that we've really built up strongly in the West Coast to service the entire country and then accelerate that action? So um, I just, yeah, I hope people see that as a, a supportive and collaborative movement. We would obviously love to have as many people joining us in that movement as possible, but it is only possible because of the people yes. that were just standing up um, and those who took that risk in that collaborative partnership on day one. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's what? You, uh, www.usfoodwastepack.org.com? Org. Dot org, okay. Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm okay. pretty sure it's yeah. dot org. Jeff, wherever you are, everybody's going to run to you. Okay, from 62,000 grocery stores in the United States, right? I think that's about the order of magnitude of grocery stores in the United States. We're going to go one more step downstream. So 130 million households. Uh, we know that households are where the majority of food waste occurs. Much of that ends up in landfill and not diverted. And uh, I'm so excited to have a conversation with Harry and uh, Mr. La Vista here uh, about how data and partnerships can really change what's happening in all of our kitchens, 131 million kitchens in this country. So. Harry, though, I want to backtrack a little bit. Dana had a really cool slide up yesterday in her opening segment about energy and the adoption of renewable energy, if you remember that. Um, we are in the early part of that adoption curve with food waste. Uh, and, you know, Harry, you started your work in climate in energy. So 
Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Totally. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. This is my second refed conference, and last year I felt like it was my first day at high school, and I had somehow read like a PDF that everyone here was mentioned in and felt kind of stalky, and now I feel like uh, I'm part of the club. So um, <laughs> really proud to be here. So <clears throat> the last company was Nest, um, and we were working on um, reducing energy waste uh, through the first part product we made, which was a thermostat. And thermostats, they're small but pretty mighty they control about 20% of your electricity bill. And sadly, only about 20% of the thermostats in America were programmed, leading to a lot of waste. And I think the mindset we had was sort of a two-pronged thing. First, if you're gonna change consumer behavior, I'll, I'll speak for myself as a consumer, I'm fundamentally pretty lazy, and I'm fundamentally pretty self-interested. So if, if you're gonna get me to do something different, it needs to be easy. It needs to be frictionless. And when we think about design, we thought about designing something that was beautiful, that was kind of braggable, that was justifiable to your family members that saved you money and did something good for the environment. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation was the, and I think this is really tied to what Dana was saying, is the systems change side of the equation. And that's what we're all talking about here. We're talking about systems change. Food waste is 12% of emissions. And if we're gonna change systems, we need new systems to replace those systems. And those new systems that will help us decarbonize the economy need to be better, faster, or cheaper than the existing systems. And I think energy is a really interesting analog to think about. You rewind the clock 30, 40 years, the way we made electricity was in centralized facilities. Now we have decentralized infrastructure, solar, wind, batteries, thermostats, tools like electric vehicles. And yeah, folks are driving electric vehicles, but predominantly they're not driving them because they're better for the planet. They're driving them because they're better cars. And I think it's really interesting to think about the role of decentralized infrastructure in the electricity grid. And we're applying some of those same learnings to the food waste grid and to the waste grid in general. And the little thermostats we made, we scaled them into tens of millions of homes, and last I checked, we'd saved enough electricity to power all US households for a month, just by putting thermostats on walls. This is wild. So again, huge round of applause. Nothing to do with food waste, huge round of applause. Okay, so you went from being really, really interested and excited about heating and cooling in homes so to food such waste. So like a sexy problem, right? <laughs> Coming back to food waste, it's okay to be obsessed about food waste. I've sorted through trash. Obsessions are good. That's what makes change, Oh, no, I was right? talking right? about HVAC. Like, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, we were talking. It's very food... cold up here, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about what this means when you apply the lessons from Nest to Mill, right? Like the partnerships that you have now, the ecosystem that you're building, the decentralization that you're working on. What are some stories about some of the things that you've learned about in the last year? Yeah, I think the thing that um, and I don't know if this was relatable for others in the room, but the thing that made me fall in love with the problem of food waste and really get ready to dedicate the rest of my life to it is that it is fundamentally a behavior change issue, which means it's solvable because we can change behavior. There's massive environmental opportunity and there's massive economic opportunity. Mm. And sort of like that triangle of things felt really good. You know, I think the mindset at Nest for us was, okay, we're gonna start with the consumer, we're always gonna design with the consumer in mind, and the same is true at Mill. How do we make this easy, frictionless, this... Um, my, Mr. My, La Vista to you, Mr. La Vista. My, Mr. La Vista, which we... Uh, mill bins are personified by lots of people, not just five-year-olds in homes. Like, everybody talks about, like, I'm going to feed my mill. Mine's named Tomas. My, you know, um, and, and, and this, the, the googly eyes um, on uh, Mr. La Vista are an homage to a Baltimore celebrity, Mr. Trash Wheel, for those that yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. A, an absolutely gem of a piece of decentralized infrastructure that prevents waste. And I would say Mr. La Vista is um, in Mr. Trash Wheel's wake. I'm sorry, I distracted myself <laughs> what we're talking about there. 
What, what were we talking about? Where was I going with that? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. You no. were very philosophical and decentralized infrastructure, oh, oh, yeah, and we yeah. talked about no, Baltimore. Oh, oh, oh yeah, no, oh, yeah. We start with the consumer. I started <laughs> thinking about Mr. Trash Wheel, and go Google it. You'll see what I mean. Very distracting. Um, Google has a very no, distracting. No, we, it's okay. We, we, you start with consumers, and then that unlocks other stuff. We got into millions of households selling directly to consumers, but then all of a sudden the utility companies were like, hey, this is pretty cool. You guys are starting to make an impact. Yeah. And people seem to really like your stuff. Oh, yeah. And actually, we're starting to feel a similar thing with Mill. Yep. Part of it's having an open mind, but like it was not on my bingo card that Mill would be in Shake Shack. Mm. And also, just for the record, sadly, there are American households that generate more food scraps on a daily basis than a Shake Shack location. Oh, and that was also not on my Ooh. bingo card. So ha hat tip to Shake Shack for that. I think like the way we think about partnerships and collaborations is we're building technology and then we're sort of an open door to think about how this can be applied. So restaurants is an example of a partnership that we've been pulled into. We're doing something really interesting in the Phoenix Valley. I know there's some folks um, from the city of Phoenix here. There may be some Phoenix yeah. residents. There's a, there's a farmer in Phoenix named J.D. Hill. Um, he's a community composter uh, that was gathering food scraps from the community, getting them back to his farm. He was having to go to households on a weekly basis to pick up that material. Uh, and then he would grow food to feed the community. And we've teamed up with JD and are putting mills into folks' households. And now JD only has to go pick up scraps on a monthly basis because yeah, they're wild. dehydrated and small. So he can serve more households with the same infrastructure. And there are tons and tons of people who hadn't ever source separated scraps before that are now participating in that program. And I'd say the last one to talk about would be the partnership with Google, which isn't actually something we've ever talked about yeah. publicly. We're going to do it anyways. I haven't checked with Laura Katz, but we're still going to do it anyways. So Send, <laughs> Sending it. Um, mills are in test kitchens inside Google, in micro kitchens inside Google, due to collaboration with awesome food service partners. And we're actually putting mills in the households of Google employees. Yeah. And we started pretty small with a few hundred employees in the Pacific Northwest. And we just looked at the data. And those 200 or so households over the last year or so diverted 53,000 pounds of food. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, if you can make it easy, you can get incredible participation and very high quality participation. Yeah. Well, I do want to ask um, uh, Pasta here a question. So, Pasta, um, what have you and your 99, what is it, 9,000 other friends learned so far? Uh, you might have to interpret. You might have to listen. What, what do you say? What do you say? I got it. Okay. okay can you help interpret? Yeah. He doesn't have a voice I, I, yet, I but keep, he has eyes. Uh, there's a slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. okay, this is what he said. This is what uh, he said. So, this is some of the things we've learned. We've had about 2.1 million device days of mill bins in homes about 9 million individual food edition events. And something that we've learned, and this, by the way, we think is the largest ever generated data set measuring residential food waste behavior. So there's a lot of opportunity here. One thing we saw that was really interesting was that about three out of four people that we talked to after using a product like Mill felt, found that they generated more food scraps than they initially thought. And when we dug into that, it was about having the bin, but it was really about having data. Yeah. And this is a scale in, disi in disguise. I'm sorry to um, reduce Mr. LaVista to that. That is sensitive to about 15 grams per edition. And we're able in real time to provide feedback to individuals about just how many scraps they're generating. That ties back to actually what it was like for Nest too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, the thermostats program themselves, but if you could send someone an email that said, hey, did you know you're running your HVAC 30% more than the average person in your zip code, you would see the usage change dramatically. So data is important, but being able to get personalized and actionable about it. Folks just say, I don't waste food. And then you say, well, you put 50 pounds in the mill last month. They say, let me work on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second vertical here is around behavior change. And the left column, and this is across a mix of geographies, uh, summarizes where people said their food was going prior to mill. And about 6% of people said they were diverting all of their food scraps from landfill. 93% were putting some, most, or all of their food in the trash. And most of that bar is most or all, sadly. 
after mill, we got it up to 70% of people saying they're putting no scraps in the landfill. And the reason for that is we made it really easy and we made it better. Well, actually, it sent me a note that I had left a sticker on my banana peel, and I was mortified at my behavior, and I no longer have any stickers on any of the food I put in mill. So thank you for slapping me on the wrist, Mr. Pasta La Vista. We're watching you. Um, and, and, and then I, I would say the last, the last bit here, look, we're guided by the EPA's hierarchy, and diverting material from landfill to its highest and best use is foundational, but really the dream is source reduction. And this is provisional data. If anybody saw me like running towards um, Dr. Brian Rowe from Ohio State University, trying to tackle him to see if we can do research together on this. What we're seeing, this chart on the right, is those two million data points, charted over time by month. Uh, and what we see is about a 20% reduction in the amount of material that goes into mill over four months. And around 40% of mill users say that mill has helped them reduce the amount of material that they are generating, either by cooking differently or shopping differently. And when we did this analysis, it was honestly like a misty-eyed moment for us at the office, because I don't think we thought that this was possible uh, at this scale. But it gets back to what Secretary Vilsack was saying, which is that nobody likes wasting food. It doesn't make financial sense. And if we can generate measurement and create tools to help people change, we're all on the same team moving in the right direction there. So Harry, last year you showed up at the summit six weeks after you had launched a product. What's next? Look, words that sort of echo through my head are actually words that Dana used to kick off the conference last year, which is, we need to be doing more things, we need to be working faster, we need to be having more impact, but fundamentally that this yeah. is the dumbest problem out there, and it is solvable. And Dana, I maybe added that little bit at the end, I'm not sure, I think we're on the same page there. My takeaway for what's next is it's time to scale up this infrastructure. and. Methane emissions can't wait, and urgent action is the mindset that we need to take every day. We can't let perfect inaction get in the way. You know, imperfect action is gonna be better than perfect inaction here, and we need to drive forward. Yeah. And I feel more confident than I've ever felt that this problem is frickin' solvable. So yeah. I'm, I'm like, I feel honored to be in this room with everyone, and the, the skills and community that exist here is unmatched, and yeah, I feel really emboldened about coming back next year. If last year we had an idea, and this year we have data, next year I'm excited to come back with scale. Amazing, amazing. Okay. I'm going to close this out with just a couple of final remarks to sum it up here. Um, do I have a few minutes to sum it up or no? Okay. All right. We're going to do a final activity which involves standing. So um, summing up for each section, uh, and the goal is you have to make eye contact with the person who's closest to you. Uh, so number one. Okay. If you are from a multinational corporation looking to connect to other countries, raise your hand. If you're a multinational corporation and you're looking to connect with someone else, okay, so find the person who's holding up their hand that's closest to you, right, and look at them and make eye contact. Okay, all right, so make a friend. Number two, if you're a nonprofit looking to collaborate with other nonprofits, raise your hand. Okay, look at the nonprofit closest to you, make eye contact. Okay, number three, if you're a retail grocer who wants to join the National Food Waste Pact, raise your hand. Okay, good, good. And then finally, if you're a restaurateur or a food service uh, representative and you wanna reduce waste, raise your hand. Look for the person closest to you. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. All together now, let's get this done. Okay, we're going to do a quick closeout here. It's going to be um, Dana and myself. Uh, we're going to keep the good vibes moving here, and we're going to get you out of here.
uh, as fast as possible. Okay. Um, I love that there's chats. Please hold those chats and come back to it. Um, okay, so Dana, how was, oh, wait. There's gotta be a mic up here somewhere. How was, um, how was the 2024 summit for you? It's been amazing, you guys. Does anyone else think it's been amazing? <laughs> Woo! Um, in talking to people, I just wanna say that I've heard um, that it was reinvigorating profound, um, amazing vibe, fun, where the groundswell happens. I made, somebody made 35 connections. Cool. And um, somebody felt like a white dot in a sea of black, and this is where they get to draw the lines to the other white dots. So I'd say that's a success and really exciting to hear all of that energy around it. And on that note, I don't know if you all remember, I put Dana on the spot yesterday. I said, um, has anything unexpected happened to you since you came to Baltimore? And I want to close with that. Dana, anything unexpected happened to you? Uh, yeah, actually, um, we, uh, myself and a, a few folks from the Zero Food Waste Coalition, were fortunate to get to meet with the secretary after he spoke yesterday. And he had a very regimented schedule. I mean, we were like down to the minute with his schedule, and we had 10 minutes to meet with him. And... Um, he actually stayed for 30. And we yeah, got to ask him all sorts of things. He was super engaged, and I was I, I, un, unexpected both for the time and just his level of engagement. I love it. And I think um, everyone has hopefully experienced something similar to that. I know I have. Um, and so that's a perfect, thank you, Dana. What a great segue to our little activity. Very short activity. Um, in a minute, we're gonna give you two minutes of quiet time. And what I want you to write down, or even better, complete, is based on something you learned, someone you met, something you did, new perspective you gained, what is one next step you can take? And when I mean next step, I mean literally so small uh, that you could literally complete, complete it in the two minutes I'm about to give you. So my, um, I often call him my mentor, um, he, t he taught me this phrase, make it so small, you can't not do it. So we're about to demonstrate. So Dana, based on the story you just told us, what is your next step? Well, one of the things the, the secretary mentioned was that, gosh, it would be really useful to have like our specific asks. What should we do with the first five million? What should we do with the next five million? That in that kind of way. So I think we'll work on a, on a plan for that. Great, I love it. Does that sound like something Dana could complete in two minutes? I'm gonna go with the no. Um, Dana, can you break that down? What would be the first step to get there? <laughs> I like to think big. Um, I think what I will do is send an email to the rest to of whom? the Zero Food Waste Coalition crew and um, make a plan for when we're gonna meet to talk about making that plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let you go. You're tired. Um, <laughs> but what I would have liked better is to say, I'm literally scheduling the meeting for that, or I'm sending the email to maybe give a recap um, and figure out what our next steps are. But that first step is the email. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go with the email. Okay. Does okay. everyone get it? What so she said. small, you could complete it in the two minutes I'm giving you. I'm okay if you don't actually send the email or the thing but please write it down, and it should be something that when you do decide to come back to it, you could finish it in two minutes. Okay, here's our quiet time, and go.
guys are doing a very good job. Don't interrupt them, Dana. They're doing great. Don't get in the way. Okay, and since I said today's audience participation, we are gonna close with that um, because it's my favorite part of the conference. Um, so can I have an example? Um, so, oh, already, okay. Oh, oh, but now you're, oh, but now, oh, okay, I love it, I love it, you came back. Okay, so I live in Boston where the municipal compost pickup is only allotted for buildings of six units or less. My building has seven. I was honest when I filled out the questionnaire the first time. So I am now emailing them asking if they will reconsider since I've only noticed one green bin on my street in the two years that I have now lived there. And I'm hoping that they say yes. Love it. Congratulations. Thank you. Pick a chocolate, any chocolate. All right. Okay. Another volunteer. Oh, okay. Hi there. I just bought a food cycler. They're out there in the exhibit hall. I suggest you to go check them out. <laughs> All right, good. That's some good action. Okay. Oh. Hi. Um, I'm a. I'm coming back to your chocolate. Oh. Uh, I'm a, um, a a funder in the room, and um, I just. Um, messaged Harry to get the deck around Mill because they're looking to fund um, bins for low-income households in partnership with the cities that they are working with. And I'm gonna try to convince our board to do so. Chocolate? Oh, sorry, my notes are on the back of that. Um, wait, I'm coming back. I forgot the chocolate for, where was I? Oh, here we go. Sorry. It's the last, it's the last few minutes, I'm half asleep. Okay, uh, oh, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. Really getting the steps in. Okay, chocolate comes after. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Jenny Kedward from Hennepin County in the Twin Cities. I just sent an email to Arika from um, Food Connect. We met yesterday and we might be partnering in the Twin Cities area. Okay, one more. Oh man, just way across. All right. All right. All right. This is great work. All right. Probably next time we need uh, mic runners. <laughs> Where was the hand? Oh, here we go. I'm going to be reaching out to the 40 plus people that I've gathered business cards and photos of your name tags uh, via LinkedIn so that we can continue the important conversation that we started here. So. Thank you for all of the positive feedback and coming to talk to me about uh, some really important issues. Thank you so much. No? Okay. All right, um, I'm sure there's other great examples. I'm sorry, I would love to hear all of your examples. Um, but actually, what was your name? Tisha just mentioned something really important. She kind of said she has a long list of business cards and photos she's taken of people's name tags. Um, you do want to think, make a plan for your follow-up because it's very easy to get home and then get busy and then forget to do it. Is this awkward how I'm like walking? <laughs> um, so on that note, I did want to say one of the follow-up items we do want to highlight, there will be a survey you will be getting today. Um, please do it. The survey that has come into Refed in the past really did influence the way this entire event is structured. Feedback is very critical and I know we're all, we have survey fatigue, but feedback for this event is really important. Um, so please do it. There will be, the last question is even gonna ask about, are there any stories you have um, from something you had, uh, kind of a connection you made in the past that led to something? We kind of, um, ad hoc, we learned of a number of stories, but Refed really needs those stories um, to justify 
you know, their own, their own work hosting this. We actually had somebody say something really interesting that she had to justify it to her own employer to be here. So we said, great, just copy and paste whatever you wrote there and just send it to us, because that's really good information too. So that's an even easier way to do it. But please do add something. If you have something to say, please add it there. And as the year goes on, if things um, percolate from, so, from something that happened here, um, please also send that back to Refed because they really do need that, those stories and the information to keep, to keep all this momentum going. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Dana. Yeah, and let me just echo what she just said. Like, we know you're gonna leave here with 40 contacts, you know, and maybe one or two projects might actually happen out of that. And what we'd love to hear, in addition to how it went for you this year, is from last year's summit, or the summit before, have any projects come out of it? Because as she said, it, like, we really, it is a huge investment on our part, financially, time, energy, mind space, to put this on. And um, I will be honest that sometimes I kind of sit back and I'm like, is this worth it? <laughs> I know people like it, but like, is it worth it? So we really are going to depend on your answers to the survey to decide if it is worth it to do it again next year, if that's moti any motivation for you. Um, with that, I would just like to thank so many people. So. Um, our panelists, our presenters, they spent so much time getting ready for this and really so much thought about what goes into each of those breakout sessions and sessions up here and side sessions and everything. So thank you all. Um, our sponsors, we absolutely would not hold this event without you. So thank you for making this possible. Everything that we just said about it being invigorating and fun and all of that is thanks to you participating as a sponsor and making this possible. Um, our exhibitors who not, you know, made it really hands-on and, and gave us a sense of what, what some of these solutions look like. The Baltimore Convention Center for being a great host and just an amazing leader when it, in the food space. I had no idea and everyone who went on that tour said it was unbelievable. Um, Meet Green, they are our event support team and our right hand in putting this thing on. So thank you, Kate and team. Um, I wanna thank Emily Broadlieb. I don't even know if she's still here, but um, Emily really started this summit. This summit started in Boston in eh, 2016, thank you. Um, and it was Emily, and she put it on, and Refed came in as a partner at some point, and we kind of took it over. But um, it really was her vision that made this possible in the first place. So thank you, Emily. Um, board members, uh, we thank them at the beginning. I really want to acknowledge Pamela Murphy. Pamela, where are you? There she is. Pamela is our board chair. She keeps me sane every week we talk and really kind of is the most graceful and um, empathetic and intuitive woman who has been such an amazing leader for Refed to have. So thank you, Pamela, for everything. Um, and of course, the Refed staff. I'm sure you have seen them running around like crazy people doing everything from like you know, grabbing somebody in orange juice to moving chairs to um, just facilitating, facilitating workshops. And you've gotten to know a lot of them up here and in the other sessions. We have such an amazing team. I used to call us small but mighty. We feel a little less small but still mighty now. And um, in particular, uh, lots of people, but Miss Jackie Suggett, who you guys just saw up here. Yeah. You just saw her up here because she's launching the entire business services unit for us and our food waste pack. And like on the side, she kind of organized this, the programming for this conference. And Lisa Accardi, I don't know where you are. She, Lisa's an unbelievable event manager. So I'm sure she's running around moving chairs right now. Um, but enormous thanks to her as well and the rest of the team who's worked so hard. Lily, Lily Hurd right there, Sam Buck, Vanessa Mukebi, and the crew. So thank you, and I cannot end without just thanking all of you. You have shown up with 
such presence, such engagement, so much energy, enthusiasm, like positive attitude. We are going to get this done, and it's going to be because of you. So thank you for bringing that and just being so here. We really appreciate that. And um, hope you all have a great rest of the day. If you're staying for the workshops or leaving, please stay in touch over the course of the year. This is meant to build momentum, not just be a one-time thing. Thank you all. Thank you.